Saturday. Thank you very much for joining us. This is Nationwide on the network service of the NTA. I'm Ruth Aguila. The federal government says Nigeria will continue to support the multinational joint task force in the discharge of its mandate, despite being at a low ebb of resources caused by COVID-19 and fallen oil prices. President Muhammad Buhari made the promise while receiving an audience the Executive Secretary in the Chad Basin Commission. Ambassador Mama Nuhu, State House correspondent Adam Musambo, reports that the president also engaged the outgoing Norwegian ambassador to Nigeria, Jens Peter Jemprod. The Executive Secretary of the Lake Chad Basin Commission, Ambassador Nuhu Mamman, is also the head of mission multinational joint task force based in N'Djamena, the Republic of Chad. He is here to give President Muhammad Buhari an update on the proposed recharge of Lake Chad as one of the priorities of the Lake Chad Basin Commission. He told President Buhari, whom he appreciated for his great passion and commitment to the revival of the receding lake, that the governments of China and Italy are greatly supporting the project and positive action soon to commence. Ambassador Maman used the opportunity to commend countries which have contributed troops to multinational joint task force, saying, however, that kinetic military approach alone would not eradicate insurgency. He said emphasis must be placed on the root causes, particularly poverty. President Muhammad Buhari said despite the paucity of resources, security of Nigeria and that of our neighbors must have pride of place. The president promised to consult with his counterparts of the Lake Chad Basin countries and all other relevant officials on the matter. One thing he however said is certain, they will indeed do their best. Meanwhile, in a virtual farewell meeting with the outgoing Norwegian ambassador, President Buhari expressed delight at the progress made in the Nigeria-Norway relations in the last four years. He commended the envoy for the bilateral accomplishments in the areas of oil and gas, fishing, humanitarian assistance in the Northeast, and other benefits that his efforts have brought to Nigeria. The outgoing ambassador, James Peter Kembrud, noted with pride the substantial growth in the economic relations between Nigeria and Norway during his tour of duty. He particularly noted the presence of more than 70 Norwegian companies in the country, as well as the important step by the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund to invest in the Nigerian Stock Exchange. The envoy also cited as a very important achievement the organization of two donor conferences driven by Norway that raised more than $1 billion for development purposes as well as humanitarian assistance in the Northeast. From the State House, Adamu Sambu, NTA News. Let's look at infrastructure. The federal government's determination to build infrastructure is a credible feat, and such projects are either completed or ongoing on the length and breadth of the country, putting smiles on the faces of the citizens who have displayed confidence in the present administration. Anthony Forsen reports that the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, alongside uh, Ministers of Works and Housing and that of Special Duties and Intergovernmental Affairs, inspected the bridge. Local Oweto Bridge lies on this river which serves as a boundary between Nasarawa and Benue State. Local from Nasarawa and Oweto from Benue, the two states are known for the agricultural endowment. And so, when the idea for the bridge was conceived, two things were taken into consideration. One, how to move farm produce out of these two states to other parts of the country. And two, to ease the long hours spent by motorists moving from the north to the south and from the south up north as evidence even though some more work still needs to be done with the completion of the bridge. 
we really thank the federal government, especially the current administration, with vigor and um, with vigor, sincerity, and then sympathy that they made it come true for us. We are very grateful. This is to give us a sense of belonging that we are Nigerians, that Nigerians loves us. The Lord is very bad. By that time, even by this time, if you drive machine here, but now we are driving machine, even motor, you are following. I'm very happy. What is left to be done is the remaining six kilometer stretch to link Owetu End to the bridge and the 106 kilometer stretch from Nasara to the bridge. With lightning facilities installed on the bridge, all works on the island between the bridges have been completed. We believe that this is the best way to answer the naysayers who continue to rail that they do not know what government is doing with the loan they've taken. What we are trying to showcase is that, yes, we've taken loans, but we are making very judicious use of these loans. And while these loans might have a lifespan of 20, 15 years, the roads we are constructing will have a lifespan of 50, 60 years, and it will outlive many of us. This government, in spite of very, very limited resources, also having to borrow is simply doing almost the near impossible in terms of infrastructure. Uh, I continue to wish that President Buhari was president when Nigeria was earning $140 per barrel of oil a day. It would have been a different country. But in spite of that, he continues to give support. His commitment to infrastructure and his understanding of the purpose of infrastructure for growth and development. Upon completion, more traffic will be diverted, especially from Abuja to Lokoja, Ajaguta to Enugu highways to the new bridge. This will reduce traffic flow through Lokoja route and reduction for maintenance work activities, just as there will be more social and political activities along the bridge corridor and, most importantly, reduce journey time and fatigue. Anthony Forson, NTA News. And on the business end, Permanent Secretary, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, Dr. Nasser Sani Gwarzo, has said that federal government is committed to achieving greater fit and the ease of doing business in the country. He stated this at the workshop conducted by the Ministry in Kefi, Nasarawa State. Let's hear from Suraj Abdullahi. The latest World Bank annual rating placed Nigeria in 131 position among 190 economies in the ease of doing business ranking in the world. To achieve greater feeds, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment organized this workshop to engage staff and critical stakeholders on the tasks of creating an enabling environment for business to thrive and actualize the country's dream of industrialization. Permanent Secretary of the Ministry, Dr. Nasir Sani Gorozo, says the Ministry, being the focal implementing agency of government, is mandated by the present administration to put together deliberate strategies for the attainment of the vision of the country in the ease of doing business. The three executive orders of ease of doing business have been promulgated, and uh, you can see how it has paved way for improvements. Nigeria has improved from the position of 169 in 2016 and also 131 in 2019 and now our target is to make it a double digit instead of three digits to be ranked uh, among the best 50 countries in the world that is the objective we are pursuing we are getting towards improving ease of doing business and therefore getting to industrial growth the workshop last two days from Kefi, Suraj Abdullahi, and Nigeria as a nation needs to take deliberate actions in grooming future leaders who would promote social inclusion and national cohesion. Well, this is the observation of participants at the fourth national leadership dialogue of the Nigerian Prize for Leadership under the Leadership Advancement Foundation. Olavo de Arewa has more. Despite their enormous potentials, sociologists believe that one of the major challenges facing Nigeria is how to incorporate the various ethnic, religious, and political views of our citizens to achieve greatness. With a focus on the present and future generations, this virtual dialogue 
examines some of the factors promoting disunity and discrimination in the country. When a leader is marching ahead of his son, he's leading nobody. Because nobody is following him. For example, Iyom says that there's no woman on security council. Is that why we are still having problems with our security challenges? As a way out, they advise the recognition and inclusion of some perceived vulnerable groups like the women and the physically challenged into the decision making process across all sectors. For you as a leader, you must have a vision that you're willing to share with everybody that you want to follow, that you desire to follow you. We must, we must consciously recruit women into leadership. It's a deliberate action. If you do not train people to lead, they cannot know how to lead. The leadership dialogue is the fourth in the series. In Abuja, Labodarewa, NT News. All right, let's head to Lagos now to join Awal. He has an update on the helicopter accident and more from that end. Awal? Thank you, Ruth. As Nigerians await more information on the helicopter crash that occurred in Lagos Friday, the state governor, Babajide Samuelu, has pledged assistance to the Accident Investigation Bureau, AIB, to unravel the remote and immediate cause of the accident to guide against reoccurrence. The governor, during a visit to owners of the affected buildings, also gave assurance of intervention in renovating the property. Abola De Salami is standing by at Salvation Road, Okpaibi, Ikeja, to give us an update. Hello, Abola. Thank you, studio. The situation on ground shows that calmness has returned to Salvation Road, Okpaibi, Ikeja, where we had the ill-fated helicopter crash yesterday. Lagos State Governor Babajide Sanwolu paid a non-dispot assessment to the site of the scene to see for himself level of damage. He met with the house owners and assured them that Lagos State Government was swing into action by ensuring that all damaged properties are fixed. We've seen the level of destruction and damage and immediately um, They've, they've taken the samples, the tests have been, are being conducted for, to understand the integrity of the buildings around, right? And once that is ascertained today, tomorrow, we will start um, working with the federal government agency, we will start the um, reconstruction and the, um, the, 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 the renovation of the places that have been affected. Fiscal planning were here yesterday. Um, I know that AIB, um, La Sema, uh, Red Cross, and all those. But you can see fire brigade. But you can see um, uh, people from fiscal planning. That means the government is looking after its people, their abode, and their existence. On our arrival, we met the presence of security personnel on ground, whom we were told had been on ground since yesterday to ensure security of life and property of every resident in this area. Back to you in the studios. Thank you for that update, Abolade. Moving on to security. Lagos State Police Command has concluded strategies for an improved and well-enhanced security and safety of lives and property in riverine communities of the state. The Police Commissioner Hakim Udumosu disclosed this at a security meeting with stakeholders in riverine communities across the state. Thomas Obiteri. Lagos, a state characterized by water bodies and aptly addressed as one with aquatic splendor, has many riverine communities. A number of commercial activities are also carried out on the waterways. Some of the recent challenges in the area include kidnapping and increased accident rates on the waterways, particularly as more passengers are embracing the means of transportation due to traffic on the roads. We just need to more and properly equip the marine police. We need to get them a faster boat that is faster than them. The the, the transporter or even the sea pirates. Sir, if the, the sea pirates are using 50 horsepower, let the police use 100 horsepower. The state police commissioner, Hakim Odumos, noted that involving the locals through the community policing drive of the government is the only way out. There are so many roads that are being affected, and that has put, has increased the waterways, transportation waterways, and there is need for those areas now to be secured. He assured stakeholders of positive results as the state police command has put necessary measures in place for policing the community 
while asking their cooperation for maximum success. In Lagos, Thomas Ogbetari, NTA News. Time for a break. Nationwide continues shortly. Don't go away. For staying with us, let's bring you an update on COVID-19. The Niger Center for Disease Control has announced 160 new cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria. And the latest figures released bring the total number of confirmed cases to 53,477 infections in the country. A breakdown of the new cases from 15 states indicates that Plateau recorded the highest number for the day with 44 new cases, while Lagos has 27 new cases, Casina 18. Edo 15, FCT 14, Ondo recorded 10 new cases, Oyo has 9, Quara 6, while Abia and Nasara states recorded 4 new cases each. Others are Kanu 3, Ekiti and Kaduna 2 cases each, while Kebi and Ogun states recorded 1 new case each. Breakdown of the confirmed cases by the chat shows that Lagos has the highest with 18,083 followed by FCT with 5,108, and Oyo comes third with 3,100 cases. With the latest development, total number of active cases stand at 12,460, while 41,017 cases have been successfully treated and discharged. 1,011 deaths have been recorded, unfortunately. On the education scene, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Sonny Echano, has refuted allegations that there is COVID-19 cases in some unity colleges in the country. In a statement, the Permanent Secretary indicates that he received reports from all the 104 unity colleges in the last couple of days, which did not show any suspected case of COVID-19 or infectious diseases across the country. While commending the principles of federal government unity colleges over the sound implementation of COVID-19 protocols, Echona urged all school authorities to keep to the strict enforcement of COVID-19 protocols in their areas of jurisdiction. He said the safety record achieved the safety record achieved with the exit classes will determine the next step to take with the rest of the classes with regards to the reopening date. There is new development in Gombe State as we hear that samples for COVID-19 do not have to be taken outside the state for testing. This is because the state now has a molecular diagnostic laboratory for that purpose. Emmanuel Akila reports that the laboratory officially opened by Governor Inouayaya is certified by the Niger Center for Disease Control to commence screening for COVID-19. Epidemiologists say collection and testing of samples from persons suspected of COVID-19 is important in curtailing spread of the coronavirus. But the distance covered from Gombe State to the nearest state to screen for COVID-19 sample has impeded the battle against the spread of the pandemic in the state. Hence, the need for the establishment of a center in the state. They have moved a step ahead. Instead of taking the samples for it to be tested, either in Abuja or Jaws or anywhere else, we can now test here. And you have the records, and NCDC has it too, that Gombe has so far tested close to 12,000 samples. But with this one now, we can double that in a matter of days. The molecular diagnostic laboratory put up by Gombe State meets NCDC requirement as the polymerized chain reaction machine remains the best globally acceptable option for the testing of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. We will work together with the states to make sure that uh, all these uh, diseases uh, that are plaguing our people, we will test them in the state, report quickly and act quickly to to stop them. Over three billion is wasted. Governor Ino Yahaya also inspected the uncompleted Gombe Mega Motor Park, started in 2012, with assurance of remobilizing the contractor to execute the project to conclusion. In Gombe, Emmanuel Akila, NTN News.
Let's look at power. Achieving adequate and reliable power supply in isolation centers for the management of COVID-19 patients requires innovations to adopt other sources of energy rather than relying on the national grid. Now, this prompted the Rural Electrification Agency to step in with an innovation aimed at supporting isolation centers with reliable power supply as part of its interventions to mitigate impact of the pandemic. Joshua Ojito will tell us more. Since the outbreak of coronavirus in Nigeria, Rural Electrification Agency has been supporting isolation centers with solar power plants to address the challenge of inadequate electricity supply. University of Abuja, which is hosting one of the isolation centers in the nation's capital, is a beneficiary of the power intervention. With a total installed capacity of 53.1 kilowatts, the solar power plant is expected to provide clean, safe and reliable energy to the isolation center. This will definitely help us to ensure that the patients are comfortable, the equipments we are using to carry out investigations are met okay, safe, and everything we need to work with can now be powered. The NCDC Public Health Laboratory in Lagos, Ikene, as well as Ibirokodo isolation centers in Ogun State also benefited from the COVID-19 power intervention by the Rural Electrification Agency, with more centers expected to be captured. We want to see your presence in other states of the Federation and uh, I use this to challenge other partners to come up and offer similar support, all in an effort to fight this monster that is dreading us in our faces. This is in addition to its interventions in rural communities across the country. In Abuja, Joshua Ojito, NTA News. Let's join Chinenye in our Inugu Network Center. She has the next set of reports for us. Chinenye. Thank you, Ruth. Good evening and welcome to Enugu. The House of Representatives Committee on Health Institutions has expressed satisfaction with what it described as massive infrastructural development at the Federal Medical Center, Umuahia, Abia State Capital. Before Andrew Kole brings us report of a one-day oversight visit of the committee to the health facility. The mandate of every federal tertiary hospital in Nigeria includes service delivery, research and training of health care personnel. These have been the priorities of the management of the Federal Medical Center, Umwahia, as they embarked on aggressive upgrade of facilities in the hospital to meet up with the present global health challenges. Led by its chairman, Dr. Pascal Chigoze Obi, the House of Representatives Committee on Health Institutions toured round both the completed and ongoing projects in the health facility. We are going to at least do some things that will reflect the fact that we were actually here and we saw massive development on ground. And we have the conviction that the person managing the place is a very, very prudent-minded fellow. Apart from being the first federal health institution in South, South and South East geopolitical zone to commence renal transplants, FMC Umwahia also takes the lead in in vitro fertilization. We're developing those uh, two areas of um, uh, specialty to, to, to be the best in the world and then um, also calling on a uh, private sector to partner with us and to make those uh, two areas of service delivery uh, the best you can get anywhere in the world. The committee also announced its readiness to initiate plans to upgrade the health facility to a university teaching hospital. In Omaha, Ifoma Ndu Okole, NTA News. And that's our beat from here. Ruth, is back to you in Abuja. Thank you very much, Nene. House of Representatives Committee on Works has restated its commitment to ensure that Nigerians get valuable funds spent on the reconstruction of key road networks across the country. Chairman of the committee, Abubakar Kabir, stated this while inspecting the Kaduna Eastern Bypass, Abuja Kaduna Kano Highway, and Zaria Funtua Road. Abdullahi Mohammed has more. 
Only 16 kilometers were covered before the Sukuk Fund was handy. And within two years, an indigenous contractor has made it 32 kilometers, about 50% of the scope of work. This rubber will leak off into Kaduna's. The committee members raised a series of queries with emphasis on quality and the need to meet the delivery deadline. And we are watching. After two, three months, we'll come back here again and see the progress. Heading towards Zaria on the Abuja Kaduna Kano Highway, the Works Committee members engaged the contractors on the pace of work. They expressed doubt if they will deliver as and when due. We asked them whether they have a challenge of payments. They say no. So far they have collected about 70 billion for the projects. Getting to Jaji, the committee members got the feel of what plays out on daily basis on the road. The contractor was given seven days to commence remedial works on potholes which have become the major causes of accidents. The roads inspected by the committee are critical to the economic survival of millions of Nigerians. In Kaduna, Abdullah Mohammed, NTN News. And more on transportation, Minister of Transportation Rotimi Amechi has assured the construction company handling the University of Transportation, Daura, of adequate support for the speedy completion of the institution. At an inspection tour, the minister noted that federal government is committed to promoting indigenous capacity in promoting the country's railway modernization project expected to be completed in two years. The specialized university will pave way for domestication of railway engineering and general transportation sciences in Nigeria. We'll bring you more update on that subsequently. And in another development to further strengthen the socio-economic and cultural ties between Nigeria and neighboring Niger Republic, a three-kilometer road is to be constructed from Madarumfa in Niger Republic to Jibia in Kasina State. This came to the fore at a meeting between the governor of the state of Maradi in Niger Republic, Zakari Umoro, and his Kasina State counterpart, Amino Bello Masari, at the government house in Kasina. Our Haliro reports. State in Nigeria and Maradi in Niger Republic have a long social, cultural, and economic relation. The visit to Kasina by the governor of Maradi was to strengthen the existing bilateral relations and specifically discuss on the measures to be taken for the completion of the three kilometer road linking the two countries through Jibia Axis. The road is aimed at assisting the two countries in transportation. Yeah, governor of Maradi, Zakari Umaru, while exchanging views with Governor Masari, said the road project was initiated by the government of Niger and is now at the completion stage. He requested Kazina State government to complete the remaining three kilometer from Mada Rumfa in Niger to Jibia in Nigeria. The governor of Maradi noted that the road linked up Kazina with Maradi of Niger Republic and other countries of the ECOWAS subregion to promote exchange of goods and services. Governor Masari of Kazina State said the state government would ensure completion of the project at Jibia Axis. This specification given is only with the state uh, standard of road, but uh, if it is an international road, federal road, I think uh, for us it has to be wider than that. But uh, we will continue with what uh, uh, you have provided so that we will provide the linkage. The governor added that the state government is to contact the Federal Ministry of Works before embarking on the project. In Katsana, Awal Haliru, NTA News. The National Broadcasting Commission has charged broadcast stations not to allow politicians use their media to hit up the polity as their do and undo governorship election draws near. The acting director general of the commission, Professor Armstrong Idachaba, who gave the charge in Akure at a stakeholders meeting on political broadcast in Akure, said the commission will not hesitate to punish airing stations. Olubukola Aduo has more. As the people of Ondo State get set for the October 10 governorship election, political parties and their gladiators are strategizing to outsmart one another as they canvass for votes in order not to heat up the polity and ensure a level playing ground for all the parties the national broadcasting commission hosted stakeholders in the state to a one-day seminar the need for broadcast stations not to become biased mouthpieces of politicians and political parties avoidance of 
hate speech, and usage of indecent languages by politicians were some of the discourse. Political news supposed to enlighten, to educate the public. Uh, once there is a commercial bias, of course, the editorial opinion or slant becomes also partisan. Paper presentations with the topics, political coverage in the broadcast media, the need for professionalism, and political broadcasts, what the court says, were also delivered at the event. We ask that you ensure that your people don't mingle with politicians or political associations as if they are working for them. Participants commended NBC, saying the lecture is a reminder of the broadcasting codes which are appropriate for this period. We've always been trying to ensure that uh, uh, the interests of the Nigerian nation is served in order that we serve members of the public. We have to be very, very alive to our responsibility in terms of what we give out to members of the public. Broadcasters, politicians, security agencies and heads of media organizations in Ondo State were part of the meeting in Akure, Olubukola, Aduo, NTA News. All right, let's head to Ibadan to join Kemi. She has some reports for us on Nationwide. Kemi. Ruth and welcome to Ibadro. As part of moves to forge a united All Progressives Congress APC in Oyo State, stakeholders have been urged to drop perceived differences and work together for the party's success. The Minister of Youth and Sports Development, Sunday Dari, stated these are the All Progressives Congress political strategy and stakeholders consultative meeting in Ibadro. Ayomiko Ajibola has the details. Worried that the All Progressive Congress APC might not be able to regain the political power in Oyo State as a result of deepening internal crisis plaguing the party in the state, the minister urged all aggrieved members of the party to think beyond the setbacks and disappointment of the past and work together for the party to regain its political relevance in Oyo State. My interest today is to get our party back. I see an APC in our state that can grow stronger. We can pick up our different parts, weld them together, and take over the reins of power in the state. Party stakeholders commended the minister for the initiative of convening the meeting, urging him to continue the mediation efforts with a view to uniting all factions in your APC. Everybody talked his mind. And I believe that uh, by the grace of God, you will see changes in our APC. We are going up to ensure that the uh, sense of unity prevail in the United States APC. And based on what we have done and what we have said among ourselves, I can tell the world that APC is back and back very strongly. And I see light at the end of the tunnel because people are turning up and they're also putting their effort and their time into reconciling the party. The meeting was attended by party stalwarts across the three senatorial districts of the state. In Ibadan, Ayomiku, Ajibola, NTN News. The trust of Nigerians in the ability of the armed forces to confront and surmount the challenges of insecurity in parts of the country is not misplaced. General Officer Commanding of the 81 Division of the Nigerian Army, Major General Godwin Umelu, expressed this confidence while interacting with officers and other stakeholders in Abeokuta, the Ogun State Capital. Adeni Itaiwo reports. The visit was to familiarize himself with officers under his command, boost their morale in order to enhance their combat readiness, as well as interact with other major stakeholders in the security architecture of Ogun State. Addressing the officers after a facility tour of the barracks, the AGOC stressed the importance of a disciplined, loyal and committed army to the overall success of the war on insurgency and other emerging security challenges in the country. He applauded the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tukuro Bratai, for ongoing transformation in army barracks with an assurance that logistics gaps are being addressed. He was later led to the office of the Ogun State Governor, Prince Dakwa Biodun, by the 35 Athletic Brigade Commander, Brigadier General Joseph Amadasun, where discussion centered on the need for improved military civil relations. Because of all of us, whether military or civil, to put our heads together to be service of life and property. 
it was an opportunity for the Alaki of Egbaland or Badido to Aremugbadebo to relieve his days as a military officer as the GOC also visited the royal father to pay homage and solicit more support for the army in Abokuta. Adini Itaewo, NTN News. And that's it from Ibadan Nationwide continues with Ruth after the break. Thank you very much for staying with us. Nigeria Christian Pilgrims Commission has continued to strategize towards redeeming the dented image of Nigeria by pilgrims who abscond during pilgrimages. The commission recently engaged Southeast stakeholders to chart a new course for Christian pilgrimage in Nigeria. Ifoma Nduokoli reports. The mission of the Nigerian Christian Pilgrims Commission, NCPC, among other things, is to provide conducive environment for the smooth airlifting of pilgrims to Holy Land and ensure each free pilgrimage throughout the year. But regrettably, the activities of some pilgrims who abscond in the course of the trip have raised the concerns of key players, hence the need for the stakeholders' meeting. Among the issues discussed at the meeting which held in Umwahia, the Abia State Capital, was how to ensure thorough screening of intending pilgrims for global acceptability and respect. We were putting a lot of strategies on ground to make sure that anybody who travels there, you do not travel to Afscon, but make sure you travel to come back home. You will go there for prayers, not for business. We we'll go there not for tourism, we we'll go there for a spiritual exercise. Other stakeholders at the meeting shared the same views with the executive secretary as they appeal for increased discipline on the part of the pilgrims. All efforts are in place usually to make sure that um, everybody who goes comes back to Nigeria. The meeting had in attendance chairman and secretaries of the various Southeast State Pilgrims Welfare Boards. In Omaha, Ifoma Ndukoli, NTA News. In KB State, we hear that flood prone areas. Um, prone communities are being evacuated to highlands to contain the devastating effect of the annual flooding in the state. Nura Tanko Wakile will tell us more. Zone of the front line state affected by a flood with an average of 13 out of the 20 local government areas affected annually. Between 2016 and 2019, over 221,000 households were affected by a flood while 278,844 farmlands were submerged by flood water. This is in addition to other damages recorded on critical infrastructure, such as roads, schools, and other public utilities. To mitigate this, the State Emergency Management Agency has continued to engage relevant stakeholders on response preparedness and awareness creation along the riverine communities, while over 100 communities have been relocated to upper lands. For this year, 11 local government areas in Kebbi State were predicted to experience flood by relevant agencies and stakeholders have been briefed on the threat and their expected roles in containing it. This is coming one week to the earlier predicted date and already some communities and farmlands have been submerged with victims evacuated to nearby public buildings while others are already counting their losses. We have lost uh, quite a lot. The Kebbi State Emergency Management Agency has already taken on the spot assessment of these communities for necessary action while engaging those at the flood prone areas for immediate relocation. Nora Tanko Akili, NTA News. Well, as the fight to end child labor and human trafficking takes new dimension across the country, in line with presidential directives, the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking and Persons, NAPTIB, has rescued 132 victims of trafficking in Akwaibom State. Director General of the Agency, Dame Julie Okadonli, at a media chat in Uyo, Akwaibom State, said NAPTIB is receiving needed support from sister agencies to curb the crime. Let's hear more from from Clement Barikyu. 
A breakdown of the figure showed that out of the 132 victims of trafficking rescued by NAPTIP in Aquabam State between January and July 2020, 85 are females, while 47 are males. The victims are between the ages of 5 months and 35 years. Labor exploitation, 23. Others, 41. A critical analysis and profiling of the victims revealed the following. A total of 66 victims were profiled to be from Aquaibom states, with 52 females and 14 males. Most endemic local government areas in Aquaibom is Oron, with over 40% of the victims rescued. As the fight to end the scourge continues, NAPTIP says its greatest challenge has been implementation of the relevant laws on trafficking in persons. If the law says minimum of five years and the judge gives six months, what do we do? We have no control over the judges. We have no control over the courts. The state-based task forces are intended to strengthen coordination of multi-stakeholder efforts in prevention, protection, prosecution of human trafficking, and are key in providing a platform to share knowledge. The Director General was in Aquabom State to inaugurate the State Tax Force on Human Trafficking in Uyo, Clement Barakuin, NTA News. In the history of Catholic Church in Nigeria, a pallium ceremony has held with Archbishop of Abuja Catholic Archdiocese and the Metropolitan of the Ecclesiastical Province of Abuja, Most Reverend Ignatius K. Gama, as recipient. Elizabeth Omori reports that this is the first time a pallium ceremony will be taking place outside the Vatican City in Rome. Apostolic Nuno. Archbishop Antonio Giodo Filippazzi there decorated Archbishop Ignatius Giagama with the pallium, a ceremony held in Nigeria as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. The pallium is a special vestment worn by high-ranking archbishops with metropolitan authority, which symbolizes the archbishop's responsibility as a priest and sign of his communion with the Holy See. It's not just answering the name. Archbishop, but doing something to promote deep, sincere, and genuine communion and unity. For the Catholic faithful, the new mantle of leadership will further promote the propagation of the gospel of Christ in service to humanity. This will strengthen our faith to serve God faithfully in all that we do. It reinforces the cardinal belief about the unity and universality of the church. The Archbishop used the occasion to call for peace, especially in southern Kaduna, and urged the government to intensify efforts in tackling insecurity. In Abuja, Elizabeth Omori, NT News. A look at other issues. Uh, the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Zubairu Dada, has inaugurated a 14-member ad hoc committee on the establishment of the Nigerian Diaspora Investments Trust Fund with a mandate to advise on the mission, sources and objectives of the fund. Uche Ubuchuku was at the virtual inauguration in Abuja. The Nigeria Diaspora Commission is mandated by the Act to harness the resources, skills and talents of the over 17 million Nigerians in diaspora for national development, setting up a private sector-led Nigerian Diaspora Investment Trust Fund is one of the three point outcomes of the first Nigeria Diaspora Investment Summit in 2018 to assist in achieving the goal. This committee is set up with Nigerians of high repute people of integrity and who understand the investment climate globally and are patriotic enough to assist the Nigerian diaspora to complement government's efforts in national development. The committees to advise did come on the following. The mission and objectives of the trust fund, the structure of the fund, especially a private sector led and driven by the Nigerians in the diaspora. The ad hoc committee has Dr. Ali Garba as chairman and Professor Mani Anebunam as co-chairman. It is expected to submit a report in one month as a guide to the establishment and takeoff of the trust fund. Uchi Ugochuhu, NTA News.
We hear that Nigeria is making significant progress towards completing its second African peer review process despite the restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic. National coordinator of the African Union Development Agency and the new Partnership for Africa's Development, um, Gloria Akobundu, said this at a media briefing in Abuja to sensitize Nigerians of the process. Let's hear more from Itarik Ben. Initiated in 2003, the African peer review mechanism is a self-assessment process for African countries to replicate best practices for political stability, economic growth, and sustainable development. Nigeria had its first peer review in 2008, and the setting up of the National Governing Council by President Muhammadu Buhari set in motion the second peer review process. The review will help achieve a proper statistics of governance in Nigeria and set roadmap of implementation called National Program of Action. Nigeria hopes to join three other countries that have completed their second peer review. What is happening there in Mali is a mistake. It's unacceptable by the family of APRM. We want a better Africa. We want Africa that will be piloted in peace. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, Nigeria's NEPAD and APROM Secretariat under the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation has since deployed ICT for broad sensitization of Nigerians and virtual trainings on the administration of questionnaires to ensure a successful second peer review process. In Abuja, Mitaire, Ikben, NTA News. Let's talk sports. Nigerian Football Federation promises better future as the first football house was inaugurated in a lowering choir state. Gift Judge brings a sports update. The first football house in the country has been inaugurated in a lowering choir state by Governor Abdurrahman Abdul Razak with the president of the Nigerian Football Federation, Amaju Pinik, and other football stakeholders in attendance. The edifice named after Usman Mustafa will provide the administrative structure for grassroots football development in the state. We're going down in table tennis because the facilities are not there. We're going to build a new table tennis arena as well. I want to make a complaint on the of the African Nigerian people to name the current stadium after a regime That is all in taking football to the grassroots. In badminton, with the aim of increasing the number of badminton coaches at the grassroots in Nekiti State, a three-day badminton coaching course has ended in Adokiti with sports officers from the 16 local government areas of the state that participated in the training. They were charged to use the knowledge gained to discover more talent in the sport in the state. We only have one coach of badminton and we believe that we have to, if we have to go to the 16 local government areas to discover talents. I think that we have a lot to translate into the players and if the next two years badminton should take over Egypt State. The Sports Writers Association of Nigeria Lagos chapter has taken possession of an 18-seater bus donated to it by the Lagos State government. The keys and documents of the vehicle, meant to assist sports journalists in Lagos to meet up with their events, were handed over to the chairman of Lagos One, Debo Oshundun, by the director general of the Lagos State Sports Commission, Oluwa Tony Gafa. It's always uh, the word for hard work, and a part of your hard work is what is any good work. stop a member from using the bus for league matches, I mean within Lagos. The donation to Lagos One was a promise fulfilled by the Lagos State government. With sports update, Gift George, NTA News. Okay, that's nationwide. We do appreciate your company with us, um, but we're not done with the best of entertainment on NTA because Sports World continues. And Buddy, I can see him already seated in the studio. Buddy, what's up? Thank you very much, Ruth. And of course, I told you earlier the match is on now. The match is on now. He's and I Asna, of course, and our African <laughs> brother, Pemerica Bomayang, just got a goal. Asna okay. won Liverpool nil. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, just before you go, a quick okay. one. We saw, you know, earlier on Sports World, we you know we celebrated, uh, you know, our, our, our African brother. We lost our dozen Chadwick yeah. boss man. What do you have to say? Because it's, we know it was a fashion icon, yes. an entertainment icon. Yes. And of course, even in the, sports beat, world, in the sports world, yeah, he contributed a lot. And this is one great talented artist who will be greatly missed. It's a huge loss in the movie industry in the world and that's something we cannot ask God why but it has happened he'll be greatly missed we can only pray for his soul to rest in peace buddy and of course let me let you go you know catch up on the match and sure okay all right thank you very much Ruth. thank you buddy all right